itiraf sila Yami. Nice to have you on the show. So let me just uh, quickly introduce you. So on the show today, we have Omo Yami Chukura, the MD of Sims and Stitches, which is a company that caters to the uniform needs of blue chip companies, as well as is into corporate branding and merchandising, especially uh, with focus in the China market. Nice to have you again. Thank you for having me. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad that you were able to, to join me today. So I wanted to start with um, how you first um, got into this line of business. I know you studied English in Ife. So what yeah. made you delve into, into a corporate branding and uniform making? Okay, so my first job, I had to work in um, a very posh dry cleaning company. And we needed to outfit all our staffs in uniforms and that became a challenge a major challenge we had to order the uniforms from one very high-end company in the uk and when the uniforms came with all the hypes and everything i wasn't particularly pleased with what was made i'm coming from a background of uh four generations of entrepreneurs my great grandmother my grandmother my mom they were all entrepreneurs and my mom had a sewing factory, even though she was more into children's garments. So I felt if everybody needs uniform and we have to go to UK to get, I can do this. And that was it for me. That was when I decided to start with a uniform outfit company. And it was a huge success starting from there. I remember one of my first major clients was a hotel there. Wow. I was doing a coat uniform, all the uniforms for the hotel. So, yes, that's how I started. Okay. So, but, but how did you get to the point of being able to pitch to a quota? And I'm assuming you had to first start with um, yourself. Could you sew at the time when you started this business or you had to get people who could sew and then you just supervise them? Well, I've always been able to sew. I can sew, I can cut, but then I won't say um. 100% perfect. And then my business model has never been built on me too. I'm always intrigued when I see people say, oh, I want I, I want to go and learn how to sew because I want to run a sewing business. It's not something that is necessary because you have to be able to think on a global scale and how to scale up in business. So yes, yeah. I got people who had expertise in areas that uh, I don't. I got extremely good quarters. I got awesome tailors and that's how I started. And my English background came into work because I mean, I speak English, I write English, I critique English. I think it, originally I wanted to study something that has to do with entrepreneurship in school. And because I couldn't get that, I had to go in for my next favorite thing, which was English language. I majored in literature. So that gave me the ability to learn a lot about humanities, you know, human behavior, how to talk, response to get. So that came into play in my running my business because I'm not afraid to pitch to people or, or working anywhere and then writing a brief and all of that where a lot of people have challenges wasn't a challenge to me. I would say maybe I'm a bit bold too, but, you know, I just went for it. I saw the need really and that gave birth to a need to solve a problem within me. So I just went for it. Okay. And that's that's how okay. that started. Okay. Well, to, to be able to do this for blue chip companies, it means that the tailoring has to be very close to the standard that you would get abroad. So how were you able to source for tailors that would be that good, that would be that dedicated to excellence? At the point when I was starting my business, I would say that I've had over, as in me being very aware of myself and knowing what I'm doing, I've had over 15 years of, of experience in sewing. Okay. Because of my mom's background, we all had to work in my mom's factory growing up. So yes, I know what a good tailor is when I see one. I know how to source for them. I know the, I know exactly the quality of what I wanted to give because it wasn't an industry that was strange to me. 
I was born into it. I grew up seeing it. It's like a family thing. So it's like your mom being a teacher or a doctor. Children in those kind of family things to go in yeah. Ireland because it's what they see every day. And for me, I grew up being there. Sometimes I work as a cutter in my mom's factory. Sometimes I work as a tailor. Sometimes I work in packaging. So I really understood the business. And then I also understand the need for what I want to make and i know who my competitors were my competitors were not the companies in nigeria there weren't so many companies in nigeria then that went to corporate uniforms really so i knew who i was benchmarking my products against which was an international brand and also if i can say for myself i i have a niche for excellent service i if it's not good i'm not going to give it out my customer service i haven't worked in the background that I worked in, in the very posh <laughs> dry cleaning company, a lot of training had gone into me understanding what customer service and what customer needs were. So that also came into play in me running my own business. So all of this together gave me a good product to launch out with. Okay. So could you say that it was because you were you worked in a dry cleaning outfit that you even knew that there was a potential market in the uniform business? Because you know, one would say that clothing is a is a sector or industry that we always sell because people always need to wear clothes. But um uniforms, for instance, or branding uh, t-shirts, for instance, is not a market that is obvious to everybody. So was it the background that you had in tailoring that knew, made you understand that there was a market for it? I would say working in the dry cleaning firm uh, gave back to that vision for me to run my own business in the uniform production uh, manufacturing sector. Yes, I could show, but I mean, I didn't want to, wasn't something, I was aspiring to be maybe like a flamboyant event planner. I had a lot of dreams about events. I'm passionate about events, you know, or go and work in a bank. You know, I, I had other dreams, but then we kept ordering these uniforms and they were not good. And for me, it was just a no-no. I just thought this is a challenge for me as a Nigerian. I can do this. I mean, I grew up, I I even understood fabrics that would work for us here because some of the fabrics, it was either they were too flimsy or too warm or not good enough for the wear and tear of our weather. So I had something that I feel the the other companies didn't have and I just put that I mean it took me the whole of maybe like a year or two brainstorming on whether I wanted to launch out into the deep on my own or not but eventually I took that leap of faith and I'm glad I did today okay so getting into a cold help what was your pitch like as in you know normally for those kind of companies you might need referrals as in something to show that you had done previously to be able to give them the confidence to give you your first order so how was that um, experience like Okay, so for a coach, before I went to a coach, of course, I'd done some little, little things by the side. I tried doing um, a bit of one-to-one -one clothing for people. I had quite a lot of clients in Philip Consulting back in the days. I'll make shirts for them and all of that. And then my company that I was working for, the dry company, saw my products and they liked it. So they also ordered for me. But then I heard that they needed somebody to make uniforms in a hotel. And I went there. I remember the GM then, Mr. Rebe, very straightforward, direct. He knows exactly what he wants kind of person. So they were like, there was a pitch. And there were like, I think, 10 companies that came. I was very skinny back in the day. So I remember when I went, everybody can say, get up. Let your gas Get your let your gas I was not like that. One of the reasons I don't know is you need to add weight. <laughs> so eventually it was my turn, and everybody was looking at me. It was this small girl coming to you know to do here because I started my business quite early. Early. My business twenty years this year, so I was I was quite I was quite young. So a lot of people. Felt maybe I was the rep for a company. They didn't feel I was coming to represent my company. So I guess that intrigued the man. And I was like, oh, you're here and it's your company. Let's hear what you have to give. And I've always been assertive and very bold. I 
like I said earlier. So I just went on. And while I was sitting there, I was looking at what other people were doing. They were all interested in showing what they have. Oh, I have this suit, I have this, I have that, I have that. And at the point where I went for this bid, there was a point where Sheraton just uh, sold the business to a hotel. I noticed their tagline, nestling uh, African hospitality with international standard and all of that. So I, even though I had some samples with me, I was thinking, what would these people want? They definitely need something to show African in what they're doing. And I started sketching where I was, you know, just doing a rough sketch. And when I got there, I just told the man, I said, oh, I noticed that you just rebranded and I, I can see that you have African um, tagline, word in your tagline. And I'm sure you want to portray that to people. Why we can do all the two-piece suits or the three-piece suits and that's what everybody is going to offer you. Why don't we do a safari suit and put like a wooden in it? So we have the international standard, the regular international jacket and everything, but then he has a touch of Africa and he said, oh, I love that. That's as, can you give me a sample? How soon can I get some? Can I get the sample in like two days? I said, we'll get it in one day. Wow. And I, just, and I went home, got to work up my tailor studio. The next day I took the samples. Someone, one of the staff was asked to wait. It was beautiful. And that was it. He just told them, I don't need to see any other sample. I don't need to see any other person. When can you deliver the job? And that, that was how I started. And from there, I did quite a number of other hotels. I did Southern Sun when they came to Nigeria. I've done uh, Sofitel Mall House and a few others. And recently, we just got signed on to also work with Transcorp in Abuja. So hospitality industry just flowed straight into what we do. And from there, we started doing uniforms for MTN staffs nationwide one of the suppliers that supplied the uniform for a number of years now so that was how the uniform business started wow that's a such a lovely story but you said something that made me um curious you were talking about uh, your experience with fabrics so I, 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 well, I wanted to ask you first of all when you started were you sourcing for your fabrics within nigeria or you knew that you needed to go abroad to source for the kind of fabrics that would suit the customers you were tailoring when i started i mean we didn't have we didn't have all the regulations that are restricting in nigeria now as of then there were quite a number of stock in the market and you can easily assess a lot of fabrics so fabrics were available and then even when i started the level at which i was doing my business wasn't like it was that's big wearing getting the hundred thousand pieces order so we were able to meet up with what was available in the local market but as the business grew we we had to look outside the country to yeah. be able to maintain the standard of what we're all um, offering and also to be able to do a standardized business that can stand shoulder to shoulder with any international company Okay, so delving into moving into the international market, how was that like? I'm assuming China was your first port of call because of the ease of doing trade transactions with between Nigeria and China. But so, did you have to go to China for your first order, or you were able to source for suppliers from Nigeria? And how did you know that the quality you were going to order would be what you wanted? Uh, I had to go to China. Because of course, there are a lot of stories about doing business in China, what China is. And even the Nigerians that are doing business. Originally, I tried ordering some things through people that were going to China. And I got my fingers burned so badly, which is why I'm so passionate about uh, speaking on doing business in China. Because a lot of people will give you the wrong impression of doing business, which is wonderful people they'll tell you it's china made with this but the truth is people go there and buy very inferior quality or don't look at the specification given so yeah i got my finger up on a couple of times working with people and not meeting up with delivery lead time or getting poor quality so eventually i had to get the visa and go myself and that was like five years into me running my business so i've been doing business in china for over 15 years now 
and I had to source for my own suppliers, get to know the terrain, know how to do business in China. Originally, I do a lot of businesses and a lot of sourcing from Alibaba. But then when I got conversant with China very well, I discovered other ways of doing business there. And I I was privileged to, to have been given a scholarship to attend Wella in China Europe International Business School by my bank. At the point where I got the scholarship, I didn't feel, I was feeling like I'm doing very well. Why are they stressing me? Well, these people must be struggling me for them to be paying for me to get an education. But I, I didn't know that they were really, really, really helping my life. And that was when I had uh, an, a, a new world view of what doing business was. I mean, I wouldn't say my business wasn't successful before I did, I went to school. I was doing well in my own eye. But when I went to school, I realized that there was a science to do, running a business. And I was, I, I've just been privileged to have been tenacious and have a lot of grit. That was the only reason why I remained in business because there's so many factors to take into place that I was just hustling through, you know? So for me, at that point, I realized that there's a difference between running a business and being a hustler. There are a lot of people that say they own businesses in Nigeria. They don't own a business. They don't know how to run a business. They are just hustlers. We don't know enough about uh, um, tax issues and all of that. For I got a tax consultant that I was remitting money to that was bringing me fake documents, and I realized we weren't even remitting for a while, which it, which eventually is, is costing us a lot to make up for but say who do you tell that story to so you have to go back to doing things the structure having a strategy total led process to run in business so that you know that your business is going to work out then the, the numbers how do you price how do you do your stocking so a lot of times when, ah, we're making money we're not making money because we didn't even know how to calculate our numbers we didn't know how to do the pricing right we didn't know and with things with the forex changing regulations changing as a business owner in Nigeria, if you don't have an education, if you don't, if you are not taught how to run a business, you will just be shading, I mean, chasing shadows and you will think you're running a business. Because I remember my very first class in Wella, um, it was an accounting, uh, <laughs> it was an accounting course. And I remember that they were talking about forensic auditing and I was like, what is that about? I was like, oh, the loans you take from the bank and everything. And I found out that these forensic auditors, they would audit your accounts at no fee. Whatever they get back from the bank, you get to pay them maybe 10% or 20%, depending on what percentage you agree to. So I thought to myself, I'm not paying for you to audit my account. Please go ahead and do it. And when they did it, they came back and told me my bank had taken over $5 million Wow. in it that they shouldn't have taken. And when they wrote to the bank, the bank responded and said, oh, it's not 5 million, it's just 2.5. And I thought to myself- It's still significant. You are admitting that you swapped me. That's what it means. So with a lot of back and forth, the bank eventually said, okay, okay, it's 3.7 million that we are, we are liable to pay you. I mean, I could have gotten the whole, Five million, or even gotten more, but because I didn't want to uh, drag it for too long, so that the forensic auditors don't get discouraged, I took the three point seven million. Of course, I never went back to that particular bank, and for every SME that comes to meet me, I would always advise them that's not the bank to go to because they prey on entrepreneurs and our lack of knowledge and understanding, and lack of education, basically. So you just find that you're working for a lot of people. I was shocked the day that I, I got paid the 3.7 million. And at that point, I made up my mind that I was going to be learning and not just learned. I was going to commit myself to always learning about this trade I want to do, this business I want to do. And then getting the education gives you what you, because an average person, we ask them to tell you, where's your business going to be in the next five years from some of their heads they will talk but after i did well i went back to sieves to do the owner director program which is a more advanced level program 
And one of the pet projects I was starting at the time that I put in a lot of money. By my second class, I realized that I was carrying a dead baby. Wow. And it was an arrival business. So I had to come back home and tear it down. I remember there was a guy in my class. He was doing his business in a particular country. He realized that doing that business in that particular African country was dead on arrival too. So he had to close down his business in the country and relocate to another African country for his business to thrive. That is the voice of education you get. And going to a school like SIBS, it, it, it was a major plus for me because now I actually got to learn how to do business in China properly because they, 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 they have this China debt and then they have the global world view. So you, you get the training you get from a regular business school, but then they bring in the Chinese angle of doing business, which is totally different from the way the whole world runs their business and do their business. And that has helped me in coming up with new products, the strategy of my business, our innovation, everything changed, putting in this China angle. So in expanding my factory, I try to think like a Chinese. And that was one of the things that kept us afloat during the pandemic. Because an average Nigerian factory, if you tell them do 10,000 or 20,000 of anything, they will struggle for months. But you know, in my factory, we can do maybe like 20,000 or 30,000 items in two weeks or three weeks using the China model of doing business. So all of this has helped me to grow my business and I kept learning from there from SIBS. I've done an executive program in Harvard, currently looking at doing a program in Stanford. So I'm all about learning. <laughs> That's fantastic. How how long was the duration of the program for the Chinese European business school? Okay, so because I'm an entrepreneur and I know I'm very busy, I couldn't sign up for any of the long program. Well, I okay. uh, like five months. Well, that is so easy and it's small. It's curated for women in business. It talks about leadership. It talks about doing business. It's curated for African women doing business. So if you're a woman and you're doing business and you really need that business to, you know, make sense and grow, you need to sign up for a program like Wella. So Wella was like, five months and ODP was like six months and uh, the program took place, we, we did it in three countries for the ODP, four countries for my for my cohorts. We, we had modules in Ghana, we had in Nigeria, we had in Morocco, and then we had the last one in Shanghai. So this also gives you the opportunity to see how businesses are done in other places. So yes. Okay. It's not so, very long. It still gives me room to travel and be able to pay attention to my business. But then I'm I'm getting these awesome learnings. Okay. Okay. So still focusing on China. I want you to run us through the process. Like if I was starting a business now and I, I my inputs, I had major inputs from China, from how to get um a visa to how to source for genuine suppliers. So where to go to within China? Run us through that process as in how would you do it now that you, you've been to China, you've been in business for a while and you've had the experience of you being in a business school uh, specific to Chinese trade? Doing business in China is easy and it's not, depending on your approach and how you go to China. One thing I always tell people is if you want to do business with China, you have to be very focused. You have to know what it is that you want to do. If you're a greedy person, I won't encourage you to do business in China because you're going to lose focus so easily. Because there is a world of magic. <laughs> everything. So for you to go to China, you have to get um, a municipal letter of invitation from either the factory that you want to work with, that you could have sourced for locally, or you meet online, so you get a municipal letter. Without that letter, you can't be issued a Chinese visa because they want to know who, who is coming to their country, what you're there to do. And somebody has to vouch for you to be there and to leave because you see people traveling and deciding not to come back. They already have over a billion population. They don't want 
mm. anybody in their country illegal. So the letter of invitation is quite stringent. So like every other embassy where you just fill a form, send your back statement, write a letter of introduction. With Chinese embassy is different. The key thing that gets you the visa is actually the letter of invitation. Without that letter of invitation, which is basically somebody vouching for you that they know you, they are coming to do business there and you'll be returning back to your country. You most likely won't get the visa issued. So you know, with that, you can go to the Chinese embassy. But uh, one of the ways to look for suppliers is through Alibaba. They quite have a very good uh, platform for people to source for. But even with Alibaba, you have to understand how the platform works. Because like with every country, you have scammers everywhere. So you have to be able to see through how to recognize um, uh, good suppliers. And that comes, I mean, it's one of the things I train people about for you to, if you're going to source, because you might, I, I mean, I have people that are trained, that do their business in Nigeria. They've never been to China and they order all their items from China. So they learn how to source. Sourcing in China is a different ball game. So it's a training that we offer and then people get to know how to, even if you're looking for them online, they get to do that. And when you get to China, there are people that offer translation business who are translators, are agents. There are loads of fraudulent agents out there. So one of the things we also try to do for people, especially with your first time, is to connect you with these people that will not defraud you or I mean, these are things that we fall victims to. So over the years, we form partnership with good and trustworthy Chinese people that have integrity. So you can we can tell you, okay, you want to go. So these people will take you to the factory because unlike Nigeria, the whole of Sude might be selling uh, leather. The whole of Lagos Island might be selling toiletry ways. So you have province that are dedicated to certain products like Shenzhen now is for anything techy. We are doing anything tech, laptop, headphones, everything. You know, you have to go to Shenzhen. If you're into fabric, you want to buy fabrics and all of that, you know that your location should be on Zo. If you're looking at commodity goods, you head to you. So you have different um, provis that caters for different things if you're into ceramic wares you know where you're going to you're looking at furniture to go to furniture so a lot of people won't know this and people will take you around in circles so we'll tell you straight away you know go to this place go to this place this way so you don't need to because it's a big country even when you get to the province where you are going to i mean you have high-rise buildings that are like over a hundred floors and on each floor you probably have maybe like over a hundred stores. So even if you go to China, you're spending two weeks, you might just be touring one building. I are not even done in one province. So you need to get help to know where to get what you want quickly so that you're efficient and effective. And when you build good um, relationship with good partners, there is something in Chinese business, Chinese model of doing business that is called the guanxi is the ultimate of Chinese business. Your guanxi basically is your network, your trusted network. So if a Chinese man trusts you and you become his guanxi, he will go all out for you. I remember one time we needed to do something and the job was quite a lot. I'd left Nigeria before the job came in. And I know it was a lot of money. All I had left with me was like a hundred dollars. But because this factory, they trust me, they went ahead and did this job that was almost like $40,000 for me. It's just a deposit of $100 because I'm their grandship. But the moment you default or default on your relationship with your grandship, it can destroy you in an instant in China. So you can be a billionaire today and tomorrow. If, for example, you are my grandship, and I'm telling people Obumi is, is a good person. They are willing to do business with you. And then your people too are willing to do business with me. But the day I tell them, oh, I no longer do business with Obumi. Even if you take a billion dollar, then they will tell you, no, I don't want to work with you anymore. 
I've been told you are not a honorable person. So in one day, you can actually lose all your worth because this guanxi business is based on deep trust, high level of integrity, and being honorable as a person. So this is the model of doing business in China. Wow. And once you can build a relationship and get to the level where you are considered their guanxi, then your business can thrive. Your network can thrive in China and you can start to reap the effects here in Nigeria. Okay. Okay. I, I want to ask you one last question before I let you go. You mentioned to me that you were having a campaign on YouTube for Google. Could you tell us that what that's about? Because it seems a little bit different from the uniform business. Okay. So we are merchandising. Over the years, we've diverse and have different products that we do. So we have the uniform making, we have the merchandising where we do corporate gifts and corporate uh, uniform. And we also have our gift category where we put together curated gifts for organizations to do activation with. So basically they have uh, an activation celebrating World Jollof Day. So we're creating a box for influencers, creators for YouTube that they're going to be giving to these creators for them to work with. So basically that's what it's about. We're just one other agency that works with them for many of the activations that we do. We've done what that we worked on other activations with them, like um, the African Day, where we put everything in Africa in a box. So it's just basically creating a box, box as different items to make jollof and the, everybody gets to do it and they share it with their fans. So basically that's what that's about. But that's okay. one of the other things that we get to do because in going to a business school, you have to also realize that you need to create products. And one of our products is this gift packaging also. It's not just uh, merchandising or swags as it's commonly called, but also doing curated gift boxes. Okay. Okay, and my last question, I, I it was second to the last before, but this is my very last. Okay, so your cash flow cycle, how is it like, do your customers pay before you begin to um, produce for them or you produce first and then they pay? Uh, so we, for the kind of business we do, we use our own funds and uh, money from the bank. We produce for our clients, supply to them. Some have 30 days payment plan, some... 45, some 90, some even 120 days. So that's what it is. But it's only a retail business that people come in and pay to okay. buy the product okay. for the contracts. We have to first do the job and wait to be paid. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's been lovely having you on the show today. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, answer some of our questions. I, I have much more, but I, I know you're very busy lead and I don't want to keep you beyond beyond uh, how long you would have ordinarily allotted to me to, to speak. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I, I hope your listeners <laughs> enjoy and learn and, uh, what we've it, spoken about. You, you, even, even I would need to look at this again and listen properly because you mentioned so many things that I have not been able to imbibe all of the information you've given just by listening. So I'm, it's something I'm going to have to listen to again. So in fact, you've, you've been very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm.